Matthew 6, 19 to 21. Matthew 6, 19 to 21. Okay, on the count of three. Do not lay Lay up up for yourselves treasures on earth, earth, where where moth and and rust destroy, and and where where thieves thieves break break in and steal. steal. But lay lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, heaven, where where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where where thieves do not break break in and steal. steal. For where your your treasure treasure is, there your your heart heart will be also. Thank you, Jesus, for these words. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for teaching us. We pray, God, that this message touches our hearts, changes our lives, and keeps us in check, keeps us in communion with our shepherds so that we're going the right direction in everything we say and do. And we bless our brothers and sisters and, and all of us together to hear your word today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. Okay. Uh, What a great warning this is and and great teaching that Jesus gives us. Can you imagine without Jesus how blind and foolish we would be? He makes the reality of our earthly actions and investments um, uh, a reality for eternity. And without that revelation, we are so short-sighted. Laying up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Isn't it our natural inclination to build uh, bigger barns on earth and just stuff them filled with everything we can find and give me the biggest house I can have and the nicest car and and the fattest checkbook? Uh, I mean, this is really what we will do if if the Lord doesn't speak to us and doesn't um, give us this revelation to bring us into uh, the real purpose and the real fragility of our lives and, and the, the temporalness, the shortness of the life. I have to read these verses because my inclination is to do everything I just told you we shouldn't be doing. If Jesus didn't speak to me, that's all I'd be thinking about. I just want to get rich. I just want to make money. I want to have this and that. Um, but, you know, thank God he teaches us through money. You know, it's, it's not the money itself. As we know, it's the love of money, right, that, that, uh, that's clearly pointed out uh, that is a problem for people. And um, the love of money is, um, is different from money itself. And this has a valuation to God. It's an instrument. It's a tool to see what's in our heart. That's really the purpose of money. So putting it into context, we, we know that, Jesus sat by the money box, the the offering box in the temple. And remember, the Jewish leaders at that time, or the religious system at that time, was known to be corrupt. They were were self-indulgent. They were taking bribes. They they weren't caring for the poor or the weak. But they put on an elaborate display of what they would give, and and the rich people would blow a trumpet, and they'd put, you know, make a big deal. Here I am. I'm giving a hundred dollars out of my one million, but you know, you look, look, I'm making a big show of what I'm giving you. But then as Jesus is watching each person coming up to put money in that box, in the offering box, he sees this poor widow who takes two copper coins that in effect equal one penny, and she puts them in, and he's just, he's just overwhelmed. He's overwhelmed, not by the quantity of money, because money to God means nothing. You have to understand that. Gold and silver, those things are valueless to him. But it is the heart, the attachment of what I place on it, what I do with it, and why I use it for what I use it for and how I use it. That's the eternal reward you get in heaven. That's the investment. It's the unseen quality of your action with the money and your, how you value it. You know, just, just as a reminder of that event, that's in Mark 12, 41 to 44. Mark 12, 41 to 44. And he, Jesus, sat down opposite the treasury and watched the people putting money into the offering box. Many rich people put in large sums. And a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which make a penny. And he called his disciples to him and said to them, truly, I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box, for they all contributed out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. Wasn't the two copper coins. 
It was what she was giving up and her heart desire. And remember, she's giving to this corrupt religious system. And Jesus did not jump up and say, stop, because that was irrelevant to him. The value of what was happening was in her own heart. There's two ends to this. There's the giver and the receiver. And if the receiver is corrupt or misuses the money or is selfish in what they do, that's on them. That reveals their heart. But if the giver is stingy and selfish, that's on them. And it's really, the point is, even if you gave money, and I've done this, I've given money to people that misused it many times. <laughs> and yet I tried my best to, to, to verify these things. But God's not looking at that. He looked at what I knew and why I acted at that moment when I gave the money. And that's on me. That's my treasure in heaven. What the person did with it afterwards, you know, I'm not looking to give it to bad investments, bad spiritual investments. Trust me. Um, I, I know how much it takes or has taken over my life to earn money. And you guys know that too. So there's tremendous value in whatever you have, and you have to decide how you're going to give it and use it. But if you're honoring the Lord, and, and that's your intention, and that's your, your humbleness, you will be rewarded for that. And money is, is talked about many times in the Bible. Now, I had somebody, um, I think it was last week, they were concerned about my request for money for Niger. And I mentioned money for Vietnam this, as well. And, it, and they, they tried to raise suspicion about my intentions. Now, it's funny because that's how the devil works, of course. You know, I'm the guy who doesn't take a salary. I'm the guy who ties the most in the church. And, um, and now I've, I've let Peter and Brian know about our giving. I've shown it to them. And Brian, at least, I think Peter, maybe, I don't know if he wrote down the, the password and everything, but Brian has it. And Brian can go in there anytime he wants to. So... Um, I don't want to just tell you these things. And if you ever have any questions or if someone comes to you and said, oh, well, look, they talk about money a lot, um, then go to them and ask him to show you. And I would ask you to not just look at certain things, but look at all of it. And you can see how much I give and how each, each person ties and that sort of thing. Um, but you, you'll see. And, and, and there's, it's not the money. It's the value of what you place on the money. So I'm bringing this up because I've learned that God is testing us with these wonderful blessings and the abundance that he gives to us. Amen. And it's not whether you're rich or poor. He tests everybody. In, De in Deuteronomy, it says that there is a temple tax of a half shekel. And it said whether you're rich or poor, if it's in your heart to pay that tax. So it was what today we would call a regressive tax. In other words, if you're poor, the value of that half shekel is worth more than if you're rich. But God didn't say, change it. He said, everybody give a half shekel. Even ask the poor to give a half shekel. Because everyone's heart is tested, whether you're rich or poor. Now, on the other end of this, he says, give to the poor. And the rich, if they don't give to the poor, they're going to be judged. So one, he says, everybody has to trust me with money and whatever I've given them, regardless of who you are. But the ones who are in need and in want, that's supposed to come from the rich brother and sister in Christ or the richer people. And God, will you, he wants them to willingly bless the poor. Everybody's accountable. Everybody has a different role in this thing. But everybody has to show that they trust God with their resources, with their money, with their time with whatever he's blessed you with. And we're told in Matthew 6, 24, no one can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. You can't do it, even if you're poor. Poor people are very tempted to hang on to their two copper coins because they're in such need. But God says, you've got to trust me too. And he has placed us in each situation. He's placed us 
in your financial situation and with your stuff going on, he's got me in mind. And, you know, there are spiritual forces aligned against us in some of these things. But that is part of the test, part of the battle that you must, um, uh, you must go through these things. And he's testing you where you are in whatever circumstance, whatever financial circumstance you're in. It doesn't matter. And don't think, you know, it, it, it's not about being rich or poor. That's not the point. It's the trust. You know, God's not a big fan of, of the misuse of his house. He doesn't want to see money changers and um, people selling things inside the temple and the church. And pastors and churches that are coming and asking for money with the wrong heart are in the greatest danger of the whip of God. If there's a church or even a so-called Christian charity and their, you know, their administrative cost is 25, 30% or whatever, and, you know, they're just taking in. I've seen pastors waste your money like you can't believe on stuff like Mm -hmm. vacations and unnecessary treats, uh, unnecessary this and unnecessary that, and it doesn't go back to the people. It stays within the pastors. I was shocked. And I'm thinking, dang, I don't even get a salary. And and you guys are handing out money like, well, you guys don't know that. I'm telling you because I'm a a defector. (laughs) They're not going to tell you that. No, not every pastor, but I mean, I've seen it. I've seen it quite often. So uh, now they're accountable for that. And if they're selling their books and they're selling their CDs or whatever nowadays it is, you know, selling whatever, their T-shirts, <laughs> that's the cord is going to come down. That, that cord of Christ is going to come against him. He's not going to tolerate that. That's ridiculous. And now if you give money to one of these charlatans, but you did it in good faith and you thought you're serving God and they manipulated you and, well, you know, you should ask the Holy Ghost and you should have relationship with them and you should try to do this, but sometimes you still get taken. Well, you know, God will bless you for that because if you did it for the right motives on what you understood, don't worry. I mean, you may not be happy about the loss or the, or the misuse of it, but you did it for the Lord. He will remember that. And the Bible also tells us if you lend to some brother who's poor and they don't pay you back, don't go hunting them down to get it. But now say they're not poor and you gave them the money and then they still don't pay you back, then boy, they're really wrong. A poor person who can't pay you back because they're poor is one issue. If someone then gets money and they still don't pay you back, well, they're in trouble. But God says, you know, let them go. I'll deal with them. Trust him. I had... uh, had someone that I gave for this amount of money. Okay, it was $5,000. They just said they needed some help with the business. So I gave them $5,000. And um, they said, oh, I'll pay back, no problem. And now we're at the three-year point, I think. So, um, and, and, and I'm kind of fresh because this was a new believer. And I thought, well, I want to build them up to know that we care and we love them. And then they used the money to send a kid to school as opposed to what they told me it was for. And, uh, you know... And then I just, I never came back and I said, hey, give me the money, you know, give me the money. I just kept praying and Jennifer and I are praying for that person. And, you know, hey, whenever you have a chance, <laughs> we're here. But the, the thing is, we're praying that they don't, because that releases a curse on their life when they are not faithful and they're not honest in paying you back. But if I go over there and I say, well, let's, let's shake them out. Let's go hire the mafia and go get my money back. Um, you know, that's not godly. <laughs> That's not the way it's supposed to work. So now in faith, I know that the Lord has reimbursed me. I mean, I'm not lacking. I, I would love to have the money back, but, but he's, he's giving me plenty that it's not going to hurt me, okay? And um, unfortunately, I, I don't know if they've learned their, their lesson, but that's speaking them and the Lord. So that there is a cost to doing business God's way, and, and it's a learning process for everybody. I would love to get that money back and send it to some people that um, – who need it, who are poor. And, that, and that's what we endeavor to do, right? So we're trying to be careful with that. Um, I, I have faith that the money we gave to Niger was used for godly purposes. But, you know, it took me a couple, few months, even hearing from the Lord to verify that this is something we should do. So 
because uh, it's my money too. And, and frankly, you know, I'm going to have the, the bigger proportion than most people. So if it's, it's like if, if you want to find a good investment, make sure that the guy who's telling you about the investment has put most of his money in it, not going to you and say, hey, what, this is a good investment. Um, well, that's, that's kind of the way I approach these things. I wouldn't ask someone to give if I'm not giving at least as much as the other people, right? Now, you can see how demonic money can be used too. It's, it can be used for both purposes. It can be used for godly purposes, generosity and helping the poor and, and sowing into the kingdom and reaching the lost and that sort of thing. Or you could have people like the Pharisees and um, they spent money to betray Jesus. They sent it to Judas, right? And uh, they also paid the guards to lie about Jesus' resurrection. And they said, well, tell everybody that... Um, his disciples came and stole him away. See, they wanted to preserve their religion, their position in religion, and they used money to manipulate, to keep themselves in control. I, I felt this way when we didn't have a place to meet. And these churches that have the real estate, they try to control. They're not asking the Holy Spirit, should I help Pastor Bill? They're just saying, this is my place. And, uh, oh, if you want to come here, you're going to pay me. You're going to pay me a lot. And they're looking at, you know, and then I'm thinking, well, where am I going to go? I don't have much choice in Fairfax. Everything's expensive. I thought if I went to a brother who had a church and they're not using a room, that maybe they could be kind to us. But typically they're not. They just want to control or they want to make a profit. And, um, well, that's up to them. But um, you can see how religion it, it can use their resources to manipulate and control things. And that's, that's exactly what was going on. And, um, well, we don't want to get into that. And I, and I keep saying, I think I, this is kind of amusing me through the pandemic, where every church is forced to not meet, or they shouldn't be anyway, in an expensive building. And they all have to do it the way we're doing it, you know. So I, I think it's great justice that uh, this is happening. Um, you know, so now it's not like I need a, a million dollar building to meet. And they're stuck with it. They're stuck with the, the price tag on that thing. And I really believe that God is doing something. He's doing something to teach people, teach churches and the body of Christ about what is really precious and valuable. And it is you. We talked about this. You are the temple of the Lord. You are my brothers and sisters in Christ. What we need are healthy, godly relationships. And our focus must be on each other and the Lord, not on the stinking building. And... Um, you know, God has a way of quieting things down. There's something called, the, there's like a seven-day cycle that's described in the Old Testament, and it's based on the year of Jubilee. Well, it's also called the, the seventh year is the Sabbath rest. It's a, it's a rest for the whole, all the land, all of the land that the Jews occupied. Six years, they were allowed to work the land. They were able to plant and irrigate and and farm the land and do everything that a, an active farmer would do on it and produce a crop. And as long as they did this, God would give them an about, a bountiful harvest. It was kind of like the manna. You would, it's the same concept. The manna would come six days and on the seventh, on the sixth day, they would get a double portion so they wouldn't have to go picking up the man on the seventh when God told them to rest on the Sabbath. That seven day cycle, the seven days in a week, the seven years, they're all the same thing. And, and God said, you can do all this great work for six years, but on that seventh year, you shall let your land remain fallow. In other words, it's allowed to grow in a wild capacity, but you're not going to farm it. It's just going to grow. And during that seventh year, you'll have enough. You, you'll have so much from the years before that you don't have to actively farm that land. And the question is, will you trust him to provide what you need in the seventh year? Now, even more importantly, what he's saying is also that the land is to heal on that seventh year from, our, from human interaction, human endeavor. And it just goes back to its natural state, but it'll still grow and produce crops. And he also says during that time period, allow the poor, allow the foreigners, sojourners to come and gather from whatever grows wild on that land. On a normal year, he also says, don't harvest all your crops around the edges. Leave something on the edges. Don't take every little piece of corn and wheat and, you know, leave a few grapes around the vineyard. 
And what are those for? So that those who are desperate, they couldn't feed themselves. They could go and they could gather those things. But if I, in my greed, lustfully take care, hey, that's mine. That's mine. I, I own that. That's not the heart of God. Now, God knows that we need to sit back and rest sometimes, right? We need it for ourselves. We also need it for other people and, and, the, and the things that we're doing and what we're doing to the world, to the land. Because God was saying, too, let the land heal on the seventh year. Now, what does this have to do with us today? He's doing it all over the planet right now with a pandemic. We were so busy. Tourism was booming. The economy was booming. Pollution's being pumped out all over our ocean, the air, the land. And now, Sabbath rest. And basically, he's saying, you know, you've been abusing what I gave you, and you didn't listen to me, and you didn't honor me by resting. You didn't honor me by humbly sitting back. And I think there's more to this story too. It's also the greed that was involved in the world. Let me get more. Let me travel more. Let me consume more. And now he said, shut up and sit down. You're going to shut up and sit down because you didn't listen to me. And you didn't care for the poor. Now we're going to have poor all over the place. You get poor who can't feed themselves even in the United States, right? And now he's going to say, now you do it. You know, now do it. You're going to see this problem grow and there's going to be more issues involved here. And I want to see what's in the heart of my people. And, and Christians, you know, you've been running around just like the rest of the world. This is a time for Sabbath rest. Stay in your homes. Stay with your families. And the time you have in your home during these Sabbath rest period, during the pandemic, reach out and seek God. Take time, take a Sabbath, rest and heal. Stop chasing money, stop chasing things and people, stop chasing things of power, and this applies to the church as well. Stop trying to be the big noise, a bigger church, big splashy stuff. Sit back with your camera in your living room, pastor, without your big group around you, your posse, your mafia. Sit back there. Do you have the Holy Ghost in your house, Pastor? Are you reading the Word of God? Are you praying? Are you loving your family? Oh, heaven help us. You know, God, thank you for this time for pastors and ministers to shut up and stop running around and go back and see what's going on in their house. How are their children doing? How's their wife doing? Time to reflect What's their relationship like with God? Not about all the show they're putting on for the rest of the world to show that they're this big name. Let me get a big name in the kingdom. Just sit back. Take time with God. Rest. Heal. Stop spending so much money on worthless things. You don't have to go to a restaurant every night. I do order out. We bring in. <laughs> but we're at home. I'm at home. I'm at home with my family. Enjoying time with my family. And um, when this time is gone, you might have lost the opportunity that God was trying to create in your life. If you're not listening to what he's saying to you now, this is not happening by accident. You don't have a global pandemic without God ordering it. There's no way. He has a purpose for it. And, you know, maybe this is a time, too. We look at all these natural disasters in California, along the coast, in Vietnam, and he's saying, you have damaged your, your land. You have not been responsible stewards, and now you're paying the price. I was watching something about hog farmers in North Carolina. It's horrible. I mean, I don't want to get into all the details here, but the waste from the hogs and the, the loss of revenue in North Carolina, it's horrible. So even, you know, some political parties are kind of say, well, we don't have to worry about that. Well, now it's so bad that even those in that political party who are aware of this problem are saying, it's bad. Let's stop and do this. You know, so we've been getting this lying political spirit for so long to cause people to doubt what's going on. Well, now you can't. You have to deal with it. And this is God's planet, not yours. And he said, Adam, tend my garden. 
And that's a responsibility over the animals, over the air. The, I am not a conservationist. I, you know, I, I have to come to this revelation. But reading the word of God, it's clear. We are responsible for this planet. And, and he expects us to be good stewards, to be the good tender of the garden. And don't fall into political traps. I'm, I am not a liberal, okay? But I also don't identify myself solely by a political party or, or a man-made platform. I believe in Jesus. I believe in the word of God. And when one party differs from the other, you got to call them out on it. You know? So let's just, let's just do what the word says. Now, unfortunately, we got a mix of these things in the political political platforms, and you can't really pick one that's fully on board with the Bible. So you have to make a judgment call. You've got to, but in your life and what you support and, and what you say, make sure it aligns with the word of God, regardless of the political parties or the politicians. Do what's right. If, a, you know, if you're ki- you see people killing babies, that's wrong. If you see people uh, um, not helping the poor, not treating immigrants well, not caring about the sojourner, that's wrong. If you see that the environment is being polluted and nobody's doing anything to clean it up, that's wrong. And uh, lying. If you see there's lying in our politicians, which (laughs) we're going to see all over the place, don't you buy into the lie. You, You tell the truth. You tell the truth according to the gospel and what you understand is right. Don't buy into the lies. You're going to have to be different. There are political spirits. They're real. And they will drag Christians and churches and pastors and everybody else into this political fight. And you're not supposed to be there. No. Seek the Lord. Do good. Do good deeds. Love people. Give to the poor. Care for the widow. Take care of the orphan. Put them at the top, not your political passions. Not a name, not a man. Serve Jesus. Those men that are running for office right now, they are not saved. I don't care what you say. There's no evidence of that. And I've never, did they ever give you a testimony of leading someone to Jesus Christ for salvation? Well, then they're not a savior. So don't look at that, okay? Your job is to follow Jesus. Be passionate about Jesus and pray for healing to this land. It's not just the pollution. There's also racial division and hatred, as we were talking about in the Bible study today. And it's from all groups. So everybody's got a little stoke in that fire. And, and to say, well, they did this, and now we're going to do that, that's, that's hateful, it's evil, it's from the devil. There has to be forgiveness, especially if you call yourself a Christian. Don't identify with your race. You do have a race, and you do have a culture, and that's still there. But that's not preeminent in your life. You need to live as a Christian and you need to love everybody. And I'm so thankful that this church is so mixed up with people from every different stinking place of the planet because that's a reflection of who God is. It was wonderful, Sherry, that you brought this issue up today. Just as we were talking uh, about Adam and Eve, they were one race. Well, where did we come from? So (laughs) we're just little subgroups Uh, that's kind of gone astray from that one race, whatever that is, it's a mixture of all of us together. And, um, you know, that's what we need to be striving for, unity, unity in the spirit, unity in love, and recognizing humans above different racial divisions. That's ridiculous. And I've heard Christians say horrible, stupid things from different races. Not to stir that pot up anymore. But anyway, uh, we're talking about money. And, and well, actually, this is all in the same vein. So when you see somebody who's poor and uh, you don't do anything, you are accountable. You are accountable to God. Um, well, let me read this verse just to put this Sabbath rest to, to rest. <laughs> Exodus 23, 9 to 12. Exodus 23, 9 to 12. You shall not oppress a sojourner. That's a foreigner. That's someone who's temporarily in your land. It's an immigrant. Or it's someone who's passing through. And they're different from you. Do not oppress a sojourner. Do we really want to stir up hatred against uh, immigrants? Is that really wise? Is that Christian? Now, we could talk about illegal immigrants, and that's a different issue, and we need to deal with legal issues. We have to obey the law. But even in that, 
you should take into consideration why those people are desperately jumping over the river to come into our nation and understand that there's a great deal of persecution and poverty in their country. Now, I don't agree with illegal immigration, but we don't want to hate people that are being persecuted around the world and making them evil. The ones who are exploiting them with drugs and other criminal activity, that's evil. But the one who's just trying to survive and take care of their family, have a little compassion. I'm not saying that we need to let everybody in here, but we need a process. We need to have kindness. We need to have mercy. And we need to look and try to verify those that truly need help and try to understand their situation. That's a Christian perspective, not hate, not division. Okay? This is a gray area. And it's not all one side or the other, but the politicians will have you believing it is, and it's not. You know the heart of a sojourner, for you were sojourners in the land of Egypt. We were all lost at one point. We're all cut off from God. And now God's brought us in. And we're all one people in the kingdom of God. We're all immigrants into the kingdom of God. Got that? We were all immigrants until we came in and took our citizenship test, legally came in through the appointment of Christ. And now we're in this kingdom together. But before we weren't, for six Six years you shall sow your land and gather in its yield, but the seventh year you shall let it rest and lie fallow, that the poor of your people may eat, and what they leave the beasts of the field may eat. You shall do likewise with your vineyard and with your olive orchard. Six days you shall do your work, but on the seventh day you shall rest, that your ox and your donkey may have rest, and the son of your servant woman and the alien may be refreshed. Don't grab everything for you. You're givers, not just takers. If you're a Christian, you're a giver. What does this teach us? Not just about what we need to do, but who our king is. Do you think he's telling you to do this because he has an opposite nature? He's telling you to do this because that's who he is. He's gracious. He's loving. He's merciful. He's giving. He's not selfish. He's not proud. He's not political. And he loves rest and intimacy. And he loves people who are quiet once in a while to focus on him and each other and just focus on relationships and not the material gain. Take time with your Bible. Take time with us like this. Take time to pray. And take time to be generous. Take time to give. This, this, our little church here, we, we're not trying to consume people's money to make us rich. It'd be impossible anyway with the resources we have. But what we're trying to do is, whatever he puts in our pot, to use it wisely and after his heart, and that's his heart. $2,000 we gave to Niger. Poor people, poor pastors. You could see, I know they're poor. I've been there and I know the people who gave, so I'm pretty confident about that. Mm -hmm. And now we have another issue, a result of not letting our land rest and not taking care of, care of it. There's intense, there's terrible flooding in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Now, some people are going to say, what should I care about Vietnam? There are people in America. You don't understand. There's no poverty here like there is in these other places. And here you have a government with FEMA and all these other resources and helicopters and ambulances and hospitals and uh, people running around and rich churches who want to contribute. And, uh, you know, they're going to be helped here. And I want to help them too. But Right now, we know people in Vietnam that are going to these flooded areas in the central Vietnam. These are friends of ours. These are not, it's not an institution or an organization. And um, they are discovering the, the government is not helping the people, not one lick, nothing. And people have lost their homes. There are children there that have lost their parents. They're just wandering around. Now, two of the leaders that have gone there to help, these are famous people in Vietnam. They're actually Miss Universe is there. She was the, um, she's a friend of our friends. She's part of this little team. And uh, 
she is uh, a Christian. She's from the Hmong people, uh, but she's extremely well known. And she is there with um, our friend Lop and um, uh, Debbie Twee. And uh, the, they are personally helping people. They are personally holding children. They are personally hugging people and handing out food. That's, that's a good shepherd. That's a Christian. No one told them to go. No, they went on their own. It's not a church saying, hey, you got to go. Let me show you some of this um, here, if I can. This is Lop. He's quite well known in Vietnam. He's a movie star, talk show host. Let me, let me, before I go into this, let me show you. There. This is what he normally does. Okay. So he's on TV all the time. This is our friend here. And uh, there he is. Can you tell he's a TV guy? <laughs> All right. So that's his normal life. And he's one of the uh, brothers that we delivered and, and uh, taught them how to do deliverance. And now he's doing it to, he doesn't care whether they're rich or poor. He's just going all over the nation trying to set people free. Now, let me show you what's going on in Vietnam right now. This little boy, both his parents drowned in the typhoon. And there's Lop, not looking like a movie star. And I, I want to tell you, I know he loves the people of Vietnam. And uh, he's caring for this child. The kid was completely lost. He can't, he's not able, this is Miss Universe here, the, the Vietnamese Miss Universe. Uh, the girl with the, the lighter color hair. And she's there helping. Um, look at the kid, he's in total shock. And nobody knows what's going to happen to these orphans. This isn't the only child, there are many. A lot of injuries. Um, a lot of people without food, they don't know what they're going to do next. Now, here they are. Here he is with Miss Universe. Um, they're, they, they've gotten some donations from people, and they're going to hand out money to the poor. They're getting ready to start. Here they are with bags of food. All right. Now, here he is uh, preaching. Now, he's praying. Actually. Trên dân sự của Chúa Khi xưa và trên hội thánh của Chúa khi này Giao ước về nơi ăn chỗ ở Giao ước về dòng dõi đời đời Giao ước về phước hành tình yêu Sự thương xót nhân từ của Chúa Còn đến đời đời trên hội thánh của Chúa Cảm tạ ơn Chúa về ngày hôm nay Chúng con được nhóm họp tại đây Cùng với điểm nhóm trà vân Được ở trong vòng tay cánh yêu thương của Ngài Để lắng nghe Ngài Ở dưới bề chân của Chúa Được hiệp một với nhau trong đức tin Dưới thập tự giá của Ngài Để lắng nghe All right. Now what's going on there is That pastor had a church And it was wiped out by, by the flood So now they're using this other church building Which you can see is not extremely well made It's not like uh, the American Thousand person seated church With all of the nice carpeting and soft chairs so they, they just need a place to meet, and uh, uh, Lop is, um, is praying with these people. Um, and they're still holding a service. Now, there's a reflection. Here's the pastor who lost his church. Here are the people. No seats. You see that? Now, when you go to visit people like this, if you aren't touched by the love of God, there is something wrong with you. And I'm telling you, I, I, when I go and I preach in these places, I feel so much power of the Holy Spirit and people hungry and sincere for God. Um, I had more pictures somewhere. Oh, here. I didn't go through all these yet. But these people are, you see the wounds on, their, on them, that they're dirty. They've been pulled out of uh, the mud, basically. Look at the wounds on this lady and her child. They're giving her money. This little girl. Look at, the, look at the face of the mother. Hopelessness. Tears pouring down her eyes. This poor kid. He's giving. Look, at, they're just in total shock. They have nothing left. Their homes are gone. Their families are gone. Here's our friend Twee, this lady in the middle. Okay, now to me, this is the kind of thing I want to be involved in. I know the people. 
I know them personally. I know they're not greedy. I know that they could be doing other things. I see that they're actually handing food into people's hands. This is not an organization. It's not a title they're going after. Um, you know, they just want to help as Christians. Now, here we sit, children, in Sodom. Excessive food and prosperous ease. Ezekiel 16, 48 to 50. Ezekiel 16, 48 to 50. As I live, declares the Lord God, your sister Sodom and her daughters have not done as you and your daughters have done. Behold, this was the guilt of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters had pride, excess of food, and prosperous ease, but did not aid the poor and needy. They were haughty and did an abomination before me, so I removed them when I saw it. Isn't this America? Is it you? Even if you're poor, God holds you accountable. We're so damn selfish. And that, I mean it, damn. It's damnation. <laughs> Selfishness is damnation. He is generous, and he expects his children to help. I, I just, I feel sick when I see American Christianity. I'm spiritually ill. I feel troubled. Now, before people run off and they start spouting their mouth off about social causes and social justice, and they want to protest about things, or they're going to give money to some secular fund. Don't be a fool. Everybody gets worked up. Well, this is injustice. There's an injustice in the United States. You don't know injustice. How about the injustice of unborn babies? Why don't you get out and protest that? No, the difference is, it's not just about giving money. Remember, I said it's not the money. It's not just giving money to poor people. It is to do it with the right motivation because you're serving the king. You're serving God and you want to respect who he is. You want to be his hands and feet. And you want the people to know the glory goes to God. And how do we know this? Remember the woman with the nard, with the expensive perfume. And she broke this thing, it's like a year's salary, and she poured it over Jesus. And the religious Pharisee, Judas, says, you know, what are you doing? You're wasting this money. It could have been given to the poor. You see, he's talking about a social cause. He had a selfish interest in it. And many of the people who are leading these social causes, they don't really care about the oppressed or the victim of the poor. They want a job to do and they want to be on TV or they want to get their name in front of people and they want to make money through the social cause. Not all of them, but many of them. And on top of that, what God is saying is, be prepared to honor me with your money. Be prepared to honor me with your sacrifice. When you give to the poor, he says you will always have the poor, but you will not always have me. So first you serve Jesus. First you give because you honor Jesus. You will always have the poor. They're never going away, but you have opportunities to serve them, but not until you serve me first. Not until you acknowledge him as your Lord and Savior. Not until you love him. Not until you take the money and say, God, I'm giving this money, not just for the poor, but because I love you. And I know your heart is to reach these poor people. And that's what you give. You're not just giving it to them. You're really giving it to him. And he'll tell you on the day of judgment, he's going to examine all of us on this account, and he's going to look at the group of people, and he's going to see a bunch of little animals in front of him in Scripture. He's going to see goats, and he's going to see sheep, and he's going to say, goats to my left and sheep to my right. And how's he going to decide that? He says, Matthew 25, verses 31 to 46. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, 
you who are blessed by my Father, Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, truly, I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these my brothers, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick, and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Truly, I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. And we're all accountable. It's not about talking about the poor. It's about doing something for them. And it's not about giving to a social cause. It's about giving unto Jesus to people, bringing glory to Jesus. Now, when those brothers and sisters in Vietnam visit the sick, I'm sure they're, they're, they're bringing the gospel with them. I know them. Yes, yes. And that's extremely important. Don't just write a check to some secular charity or some political cause. Go to the place where Jesus is. Go where his hands and feet are working and people are loving and sharing the gospel with them. And when you have an opportunity like this, don't shut your hand to the poor. Don't bring a curse and a judgment on you or this nation. We don't need any more. We have enough. And it's not about, I don't want just the United States of America to give people money overseas because they don't care about that. You know, USAID can give money to the poor. Wonderful, mazel tov. But I want people to know that Jesus cares. And I want people to know that we are Jesus followers. And I want to give as a body of Christ to those that I know are going into the mud and touching the dirty and laying hands on the sick and comforting the orphan and the widow. And they're doing it at our sponsorship with our prayers behind them. And we are one family one God-given entity that's trying to reach these places in the name of Jesus. An opportunity to serve God by serving others. And when you look at those poor people that I just showed you, you're looking at the face of Christ. You're looking at his leg up in the cast. You're looking at those hungry stomachs and the women who don't know where their husband is. That's Jesus And then we just sit our fat butts down in our churches and watch TV and, and watch Joel Osteen or whatever. <laughs> uh, we're, we're not even doing that half the time. We're going to work and worrying about our promotion and, oh, you know, I got to have this and I got to have that. And, uh, boy, this ring isn't big enough for me. I deserve something better than that. My husband got me this little ring. I'm just... <sighs> and don't let the unbelievers outshine you. I told my boss, who's not a believer, about Aquila and the, and the drug addicts in Vietnam. And, and I said, you know, we were there ministering and she didn't even ask. She took 20 bucks out of her pocket and handed it to me. She says, give it to them. I mean, you know, I have to understand she's not a believer. And, and, but for someone to stand there on the spot and hear the story and just put money in my hand and didn't ask for a receipt. Um, I've had other Christians who didn't give a penny. So, you know, tell me. <laughs> You know, God's checking your heart. He's measuring it. He's sizing up, baby. How big is this thing? How small is it? Is it the Grinch heart or is it the big heart? So now I'm talking to Jennifer about this, and uh, people are starving and they're in desperate need right now. I don't have time to wait for you guys to give money if you give any at all. So we're going to go ahead and, and, and we're going to give $1,000 from the church just so there's something in their hands. But that's just the beginning. So now if you want to give... 
uh, please do so. Now, what we're going to do is, um, some of you uh, will know uh, a pastor and his wife here. It's a Pastor Hai and, um, and his wife, Hang. Well, Debbie Twee is their sister, is his Hang's sister. Um, and we're going to give money to them to give to Twee. Twee was one of the ladies in those pictures. Uh, and then they're just going to go out and buy the food and hand it to people. And, and, and now there are orphans there, and I don't know. That's a, that's a tough one. I mean, I just don't know what's going to happen. But I want to be available if there's something we can do to help. But that's going to have to evolve. I don't, have a, um, I don't know what that would be. And then we're going to continue asking them about needs. But, you know, they, they just got in their, in their cars or whatever and drove down there. So it wasn't like they could tell us we need so much money and we're going to do this. It's not like that. It's, let's just get food and let's just go help those people and, and hand them some cash. And I saw them handing out money in envelopes. And, you know, maybe that's probably the best way. Those people know what they need and, and they're going to need money. So, and you can see they're not taking advantage of you when they don't have a house and they don't have any food and they're, they're, they're in the hospital bed and can't even pay their hospital bill. So just give it to them. Religion, this is James 1, 27. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction, and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Amen. Do something. Do it. Job said in, in 29, 11 to 14, When the ear heard, it called me blessed. And when the eye saw, it approved, because I delivered the poor who cried for help and the fatherless who had none to help him. The blessing of him who was about to perish came upon me, and I caused the widow's heart to sing for joy. I put on righteousness, and it clothed me. My justice was like a robe and a turban. Your righteousness is covering you through your generosity to the poor, to those in need. You know, we pray for the deliverance of people. We pray for the power of God for healing. This is important, too. <laughs> care for the poor, the widows, the oppressed. It costs you something. Christianity costs us something to be like Jesus. And Paul, when he went to the church of Jerusalem and he told them about all the Gentiles being saved, he got some instructions. But one thing they told him in Galatians 2, 9 to 11, and when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, I love his uh, sarcasm, <laughs> perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me, that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. Verse 10, only they asked us to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. It underlies the entire gospel. It's everything. It's everything to Jesus. It's God's heart. And while you don't have money to go on vacation, there's nowhere you can. I mean, now you have money because you're not going on vacation. You're in a Sabbath rest. What are you going to do with that money? Do you want to help these kids who don't have parents and no food? It's your choice. But God bless you if you give to somebody. If you don't trust me and you don't want to give to Vietnamese people because you could care less about them or anybody else that I'm talking about and you say that I'm a, I'm a thief and trying to get money out of your hand, then give to somebody else. Somebody you trust. But don't sit there and criticize other people and don't sit there on your little two coins. Your money's nothing. Nothing. It can go away tomorrow but I would rather put my hands in the work of God and help these people and then know that he will bless me and look after me than to stingily hang on to my little couple of pennies and just keep it in my pocket so that I can get an extra bagel tomorrow. I mean, this is so short-sighted, so stupid. The enemy's deceived people. 
And you know, even uh, pray that God will open hearts. You can't serve two masters. You can't serve two masters. And here's a final warning here. 1 Timothy 6, 5. People who are depraved in mind and pride of the tr truth, imagining that godliness is a means of gain, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. As for you, O man of God, Flee these things, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Verse 17, as for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. O Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you. Avoid the irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge, for by professing it, some have swerved from the faith. Grace be with you. Don't be deceived, children. You are rich. I've said this before. You look at where you stand compared to the rest of the world. Even if you're poor in America, you're still rich to the rest of the world. Don't fool yourself. You're still accountable for poor people, even if you are what you consider poor. So do the work of God. And even if you're rich, your money's not going to help you, baby. It's what you do with it. And you've got to use it for the good works. If you sit there worrying that you're not going to have enough and yet your pile keeps growing and you never give anything to the poor or you're, you're really cheap with it, you, you're bringing a condemnation on you. God's testing our hearts. Oh, Lord Jesus, Lord, we pray that we take this to heart, that we're not deceived by the wealth in this nation and the people, especially in Northern Virginia, who are proudly displaying beautiful cars and homes and huge bank accounts and flashy jewelry. Lord, this is not the place we want to dwell in. We want our hearts and minds to be set upon you. And even God, even though you may, you may bless us financially, that we will not just sit there and enjoy it only for ourselves, but we will use it for good deeds. We will be rich in good deeds. We will find those as the Holy Spirit leads us to those that are poor, those who are oppressed, to the widow, to the orphan, to those that we know we can trust with the money. We believe we can trust with the money. And God, even so, even if there's a chance to give, maybe there's even opportunity to do. We, we, if we can't do, we will give. Lord, we will not just put our coin, our talent in the ground, but we will at least give it to the bankers to earn interest. We will at least give it to brothers and sisters who are doing something with the money to help the poor, that we are representing true Christ in these situations. And Lord, we can at least pray for them. We can at least follow the course of their activities, the missions they're on, that you've sent them on, and that we can be engaged, we can care, we have compassion for these people. We are not just saying they're in some faraway land, but that we are connected to them by one spirit, by the presence of God that goes with our brothers and sisters who are the hands and feet. And Jesus, we pray. I pray for my own heart. I don't want to be selfish. I don't want to be uh, just sitting back in wealth. Lord, please help train my mind and my wife's and our church, that we will go and help. We will do. We'll give more generously. Uh, we will not have a fear of helping. We will, we will desire this. We will love people through our contributions. And not just sitting back, but we will pray, God, please show us opportunities 
that you send us to to help people, that we are not just consuming excessive food and resting in our prosperous ease, that we are motivated to truly do this thing and separate us from the politics and secular social causes, that everything we do, we do to honor you. When we help the poor people, we're thinking of you. We're always thinking of you. We're loving people as if it's you. Lord, we pray that on the day of judgment, you will remind us of the times that we helped people with a cup of water, those that were thirsty, those that were hungry, those that were naked, those that were imprisoned, those that were widows and orphans, and we helped them. And you'll say, you helped me. When you did that, you helped me. You are a sheep that I chose before the foundation of the earth, and you proved my choosing was correct by your actions. But those to the left will be goats cast off into eternal damnation for their selfishness, rich and poor. Lord, quicken our spirits. Take the focus off our own lives. And some of us, I've been reminded of this while I'm preaching. Some of us are caught in sin, and we're more focused on our sin and our struggles with that sin, and it's consumed us to the point where we're not even thinking about anybody else. Brothers and sisters, we've got to repent. We've got to turn away from this, and we've got to refocus on the things of God. And we have to be mindful of others that are in need, and we need to make it a passion in our lives. And God, I pray you put generosity not just the token flip of a few bucks into the buckets to get it off your conscience, but something that's meaningful. I, I don't know what your finances are. It's, you know, whatever that is, two copper coins. I don't know, but God knows, and you know. And something that means something so that the Lord has something to write down on your ledger instead of a mocking or a laughing or a discrediting of the gospel. And you... Oh, Lord, let there be power in your people and our generosity and our love and compassion for the poor. We rebuke the political spirit. We rebuke selfishness and greed and pride. We want no part of that. We thank you, Jesus, for what you've provided for us and what you will. And we bless. I bless my brothers and sisters to be givers, not just takers, to be mindful of the treasury bank account we have in heaven, if we're putting anything into it or not, and to be letting go of the things of this world and our desire to be a part of it and instead reaching out into heaven through our gracious actions of generosity and love to those in true need. In Jesus' name we pray. Oh Lord, we, we pray for the poor all around this world, not just Vietnam, but God, this is something you put into our, uh, our laps. This is something you're pointing us to. Uh, we thank you for the opportunity we've had to serve, uh, to help serve you in Niger. And, um, in Africa, and also we, we uh, thank you for this opportunity. We know there are many others, but we pray for personal relationships and trusting relationships so we know where you're leading us and, and to whom to give. Mm-hmm. Uh, and um, we know that there are poor people everywhere, but uh, we want to be direct. We only have so much money, and we need to be directed by your Holy Spirit um, to put compassion and love on our hearts and generosity for those that you're calling us to help. And we also pray, God, that you show us the people in America uh, and the right way to help people here as, as there's also great need in this nation. It's different, but um, we don't want to neglect uh, those who are also in need here, um, even though there are many more resources here to help. But God, your way, your will. Um, but first, send us to those that are in absolute destitute need, that they cannot help themselves. Those are the ones, Lord, we ask you to lead us to those and bringing the gospel with that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, uh, Lord, I I pray blessings over our brothers and sisters now, and I pray uh, for the welfare of our uh, brothers and sisters in Vietnam who are serving you. We pray for their safety and um, their wisdom, and uh, we pray uh, for wholeness in our family of Christ here in ICF, and um, uh, compassionate, loving hearts, just like yours. We want to be like you, not like the way of this world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.